I'm going to begin by showing you two music videos. No, no, that's not the music. <laughs> It's PG-13, so don't worry. So it imports the more recent American and Western pop music 
and you can hear it then in the beat. So to make it very simple, uh, AKB48 sings in eight beats. A bit fast, but not really fast. Gross generations are in 16 beats. AKB48 does a downbeat, which is a very classic way of doing pop music, stress on the first beat. Gross generation tries to do some of the back beats which is a much more recent hip-hop infused African-American music in which the stress is on the later beat, and so on down the line. Dancing routine, obviously visually, is very different. AKB48, they just roll around in their lingerie. <laughs> I think it's something I could do, but <laughs> you probably want to watch me do it. Gross generations, uh, though the routines look relatively simple, actually it's not as easy as it seems. I know mainly because I tried to copy them. <laughs> the appearance is, of course, quite different. Hair color, to take one, AKB48, they're all black, as most East Asian hair color tends to be. Straight hair, usually bob shoulder length. They are trying to mimic a sense of being girls next door, any high school or young women in their early 20s. Girls' generation, you notice, have all kinds of hair. Some are blonde, some are brunette, others are black. Some have curly hair, others have straight hair. Some have long hair, others have short hair. And this is a very conscious strategy on the part of the production team to appeal to different kinds of taste. Some men, some women like long hair, others don't, and so on. <coughs> if you look at this photo in which they appear together in a Japanese TV program, they look like two different races of people. Girls' generation look like Amazons, towering over these Lilliputian Japanese women. <laughs> the fact actually is, is I've actually taken official statistics, so I know that on average, members change every year, as I mentioned, for AKB48. But on average, girls' generation members are three to four inches taller than AKB48 members. And interestingly, and this becomes somewhat important later, the mean height of gross generations are actually taller than mean South Korean women of that age, whereas for AKB48, they're actually shorter than girls in Japan of that age. And I think it's a lot to say about how, what kind of people they appeal to. As for ability, of course, if you're Japanese kind of pop culture nationalist, they say AKB48 people are talented. Well, actually, they are. Because the whole point is that they are supposed to appeal based on their authenticity. And authenticity, in the case of ordinary girls next door, is that they don't actually sing very well. They don't compose music. They don't play instruments. In fact, they don't do very much. Right? But they are girls next door. Girls generation, it's very different. They are supposed to be good, good at singing, good at dancing, they're slim, they're taller than average, so on and on. And these ability differences manifest themselves in something like language proficiency. AKB48 members, as far as I could do research, speak no other language but Japanese. Of course, everyone knows some English phrases, I love you, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but by and large, they're monolingual. In girls in Asian group, as you probably notice, because they sang in Japanese, two of the members are relatively fluent in Japanese. Two of the members are relatively fluent in Mandarin. Two of the members are fluent in English. And this is, of course, the conscious decision on the part of the producer to create a global pop music sensation. Now, in trying to do this comparison, the point I'm trying to make is not to say that each group reflects the country of its origin. I'm not saying somehow that AKB48 expresses something very deep about contemporary Japan, and I am not suggesting that girls' generation say something very deep about South Korea. Each country is actually highly complex and diverse. Japan probably much more so because it's a land of subcultures. It's a country where you can find, still, many shops selling LPs of jazz classics, classical Western music, 
and so on. So the point is not that the popularity of the group makes it somehow essential, essentialist representation of each national culture, but rather something slightly different, which is that they represent one leading edge of the music industry, namely the pop music that appeals mainly to teenagers and sometimes to men and women in their early to mid-twenties. Now, this is a very common phenomenon in all OECD countries, that the leading edge of the pop music industry caters to teenagers who have the money, disposable income, but more importantly, the willingness to spend all their money that they earn or pick from their parents on downloading songs, or in the case of Japan, buying CDs. Now, the culture industry has become a very important concept in the social sciences, but what's really striking is how recent the phenomena is. It really is usually traced to the Frankfurt School and scholars like Pedro Adorno pictured there. But it's a particular genre of culture that is produced for consumption. That is to say, it's made to be sold and bought in the marketplace. And what's really interesting is that even though one might think that popular music has been around forever, popular music made for profit, it in fact can usually be dated only to late 19th century in the United States, usually called Timpan Alley, uh, area in Manhattan around West 28th Street, 5th Street, 5th Avenue, 6th Avenue, for if you go today, there are some Korean restaurants. But that's not the connection <laughs> I'm trying to draw. From its origin in late 19th century, it quickly spreads around the world. It comes to Japan, and most historians of Japanese popular music date it to 1914. So a particular song called Kashu Chana Uta, which I will not show you. It's not particularly interesting to most of you here. Mm -hmm. And in the case of South Korea, or Korea, to a particular singer named Yun Shim Dok, who, in translation into English, became popular with a song called Him to Death. It's not a very uplifting uh, title. Usually pop music is about love, happiness, you know, stuff like that. Uh, the reason that, uh, in, this is basically a footnote, is that Yun actually fancied herself as an opera singer. Even though she had never been to a single opera performance and didn't really sing an opera song. So what's interesting about this song is that it's actually a waltz that's taken from a late 19th century Russian composer. But curiously, Yun sings it in four beats. Now, you may not know much about classical music genres, but one thing you probably know is that waltz is in three beats. So why would a singer take this four beat song, a three beat song, and make it into four beats? And the reason is, is that Koreans at the time took three beat music to be very traditional. Yeah, it's usually a musicologist called like Changdan beat long, short, long. So one song that every Korean is supposed to know is song of Ariran, right? So if you try to sing it, Ariran, uh, so you see long beat, short beat, long beat. And that's a traditional Korean beat. And so they took popular music, which they took to be a Western genre, to require something very different. So what Yun does is to sing it in four beats. Very, very strange. But the point I'm trying to make is that the birth of these commodified music is actually very recent, right? in the last hundred years or so. And what unifies popular music as a commodity, of course, is that it wants to make money. It wants to generate profit. It's not there to express something deep about the singers or the composers trying to bear their romantic soul. Now, there is a in Western aesthetic that actually gets imported into East Asia as well, a deep strain of romanticism. 
for my purposes, I want to suggest that Romanticism actually tried to express something deep about one's soul. Right? It's a reaction to classical get received music or art form. And they tried to do something innovative by expressing something deep within yourself. So there's a profound stress on autonomy. You don't do it because someone wants you to compose a particular song or sing a certain way. You do it because you want to express something about yourself. It's uh, just because I'm speaking in Canada, I feel that we should respect the bilingual nature of this country. You know, art for art. It's art for art's sake. Right? It's not done because you want to be famous, you want to make money. You do it like Beethoven because you want to express something, or that's the popular belief. The right lower hand is a Japanese manga called No, no, no Dame Kantabire, which became very popular. And No Dame is a classical pianist who really enters this because she wants to express something deep within her soul. So that's an expression of romantic ideology. However, we know that for girls' generation, or AKB 48, that's not what's at stake. Rather, the point is that they are there to be popular, to make money. How do I know this? Well, because I had looked deep and hard into the people who produced these two groups. The mind behind AKB48 is this man to the right. He looks like a Japanese salary man. Yes, he is. Akimoto Yasushi about my age, actually. It's uh, anyway, he became uh, kind of popular by producing an idol girls group called Onyanko Club in 1985, which is something of a predecessor to AKB48. However, we know that he was not trying to pursue a particular aesthetic line, particular aesthetic program. Because before he did Onyanko Club, what he did was do very, very wide variety of musical genres. One is a group called Alfie, which was popular in 1980s. It's kind of a folk rock group, uh, kind of a predecessor of transgender group that you see today. The other stunt he pulled was getting an African-American guy, Jero, who looks like a hip-hop singer, but actually sang Enka a very traditional, in Korean it would be trot, music. Uh, trot was, or enka was a dying genre, and he tried to infuse it with fresh approaches. And one way is to get an African-American guy singing enka. Uh, he also composed for the queen of enka, this very traditional Japanese popular music genre, and the last song, Misora Hibari, the queen of Japanese pop music in many ways, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s was actually composed by Akimoto. The point I'm making is that there is nothing that unifies musically, at least that much, between Enka, folk rock, and later on, idol music. Basically, Akimoto was doing different things that were kind of popular at the time to become popular, to make money. The girls' generation counterpart is Lee Suman, Suman Lee in the English articulation, who is slightly older than Akimoto, but basically looks like him. I mean, of course, most Asian men look alike, but <laughs> nonetheless, they look especially alike. He shot to fame by producing South Korean acts that became popular in Japan. Uh, Tongban Shingi, or Toho Shingi, or they have like six different names. Uh, to the right, and to the left, Boa. Now, what's interesting is, if I have more time, I will show you an interview of Boa in 1992, in which this teenage South Korean girl actually manages to speak Japanese flawlessly, fluently. Now, Boa is someone who was born to Korean, ethnic Korean parents in South Korea. And one thing you may have learned in your classes or from experience is, though grammatically, Japanese and Korean are quite alike, phonetically or phonologically, they're very different. It's almost impossible to be truly fluent 
sound like something like a native in both Japanese and Korean. Well, Boa was one of them. And indeed, for most Japanese fans at the time, this is 1990s, they did not know that these two groups, two acts, were Korean. They just thought they were another J-pop act. And before he did this, Usu Man was a student radical at Seoul National University. He sang folk rock songs because it's not, it's really more folk music, kind of Bob Dylan-like folk music, because that's the genre of music leftists, young leftists at the time in the 1970s and 80s sang. So he had this very anti-government streak because to be cool, so to speak, at the time, to be popular, if you will, to be kind of blunt, you have to be leftist and be anti-government. Later on, he does something completely different. He gets blacklisted in South Korea. South Korean government used to blacklist everyone. Uh, they used to blacklist the uh, Beatles music, for example, because it was a potential threat to the government. It's very hard to see how that's possible. But anyway, um, Isuman, and this says something about him as well, he majored in agriculture at Seoul National University, but when he went to the US, he switched to computer science. He knew always which way the wind was blowing. Agriculture is the past, computer science is the future. But more seriously, he watched Star MTV when he was in Northridge, California, and tried to import at first hip hop into South Korea. He was the first really to bring hip hop music into South Korea. And later on, he tried to import J-pop. Now again, I don't mean to be hard on these men, but it's hard to see an aesthetic consistency or commitment, right? You don't expect Beethoven one day, right, because his Ninth Symphony wasn't selling very well, to change to hip hop, because that's the way to go. You don't expect Bob Dylan one day from going from folk rock to sing opera, or the next day doing hip hop, because these artists pride themselves on something that I'll call romantic ideology, commitment to aesthetics, particular aesthetics, expressing something deep within oneself. Akimoto and Lee basically don't care because when wind blows some other way, they are happy to go along because they're there to sell something. Now the end point of popular music, not just in Japan and South Korea, but in many OECD countries, was that increasingly the age group of people consuming popular music became younger and younger. This has a lot to do with the rise of teenagers and the uh, autonomy and the ability they had to consume popular culture products. Now this may seem very strange because teenagers seem like sempiternal entities. I mean, of course there were teenagers back in ancient Greece or classical China. But in fact, that's not true. They only really emerged in the US in the 1950s, and then quickly and unfortunately spread around the world. <laughs> what I mean by that is if you wanted to consume music, most of you have smartphones or iPods or something today. You want to listen to music, you just pop your buds and reproduce it at will. What is hard to understand, we always talk about how the future is hard to see, but the past is actually more opaque. It's hard to imagine living in a world when pop music is not readily available. What I mean by that is even something primitive like radio, at least in South Korea, was very uncommon into the 1980s. Most Households didn't have TV at the beginning of 1960s in South Korea. But of course, by 1980s, almost everyone had it. But even in the 1980s, they only had one TV set, one radio set. What that means is that in the older tradition of Korean culture, because older people could choose, you have to watch these boring music programs that featured truck singers, not the young, cool singers. And it's only after democratization and industrialization that more or less succeeded in making South Korea affluent 
That is to say, really in the 1990s, the South Korean youth could have the means, the technology, and the disposable income, and autonomy from their parents and elders to consume music on their own. In Japan, of course, this happens somewhat earlier. And a particularly important medium in this regard is television. That becomes really hegemonic in Japan, at least in urban Japan, in the 1960s, South Korea a bit later, into 19, late 70s, early 1980s. And what television does is it inflates the importance of the visual, obviously. You have to be easy on the eye. You have to look nicer. And it's not that singers were ugly before, because they always performed, and beautiful or good-looking or handsome people were always favored. Unfortunately, beauty and quality is one of the things that social scientists haven't studied as much. But I think it's quite a significant feature of American and actually universal life. In any case, in Japan, the youth idols become really popular and prominent sometime in the early to mid 1970s. In the South Korea, in South Korea, it comes much later, probably in the mid 1980s. But to give you a sense of how different this was, this is Kim Wonson to your left, who was at the time called Madonna of South Korea. She used to actually dress a bit like that and dance like somewhat suggestively, and so she would actually be arrested for being lewd and actually being immoral in the mid-1980s in South Korea. This is Sobancha, or a fire truck, uh, the first pop idol group, I think, in South Korea, who became popular in 87 or so. And what's interesting, and I'll remark on this a bit more later, is that the real idol was the chubby guy in the middle. It's very interesting to you. Yeah, it looks like Kim Jong-un a bit. <laughs> I'll get back to this. But the point about these idols is that they become consumption goods that demarcate each generation from other. So at first, that these groups are groups that your parents hated. Increasingly, these are groups that your older siblings older sisters and brothers hate, thereby attaining a sense of newness, a sense of youth, who are forever on the cutting edge. But what this means is that over time, there's a rapid turnover of stars. There are pop stars in 60s in Japan or 70s in Korea who would remain pop stars for a decade or more. Increasingly, K-pop stars have, at most, a five-year lifespan. In the case of J-pop, it's a bit longer, but most of them come and go. The poster is from the film that, according to British Film Institute, is the greatest movie of all time, Tokyo Story, Tokyo Monogatari. The point I'm trying to make is that, though this is a classic of Japanese popular culture, Right, Japanese film. I taught in Japanese universities now for maybe five different times at five different universities, but I have yet to have a student who have seen this film. <laughs> What's even more shocking is they don't actually know who Ozu is, this iconic great filmmaker that North American students majoring in film or popular culture all know by heart. In Japan, he is just a forgotten figure. Now, in addition to this acceleration, this rapid turnover of stars, there's another trend that's actually quite significant, which is something that I will call secularization. Secularization. Meaning that classical idols, even in pop music, used to be semi-sacred figures. The pop figure is a book cover of a Japanese pop music star from 1980s named Yamaguchi Momoe. And the title of the book is Yamaguchi Momoe is his Bodhisattva. She's a Buddha who came back to samsara, our world, to save us. So she is like an idol, right, in this classical religious sense. 
This is the top vote getter, Sashihara san, on the bottom right, who was the top vote getter two years ago in AKB48 election. This is a TV special, and she is there trying to fart loudly in the library. So, and it's very vulgar. It's very profane. It's certainly not something that you expect Bodhisattva to do, come back to life so that she can fart loudly in your school library. <laughs> to give you even more sense of this secularization, the thing on the left is a manga, uh, which is a very popular manga in Japan today, called Young, Saint Young Man, in which Jesus Christ and the Buddha come back to life, and they live in downtown Tokyo because they're kind of tired of trying to save humanity. So they're trying to respond. But he's being used now, this Jesus Christ figure, as uh, an icon for employment magazine that's very popular in Japan. And he's talking about how I think it's fine for me to show up in a commercial where I change my job from being the savior to something else. And he says on the left, I changed my job at 30, because you know Jesus supposedly right, around 30. Uh, so it was kind of scary. Scary to change his job when it was 30. Mm -hmm. uh, the point being, of course, that pop culture has become very profane and vulgar, right? No more secularization. So what is at the heart of innovation than for these two groups. For AKB48, I think there are at least three elements which are important. One is the fact of their realness, their authenticity. The reason they don't sing well, they don't dance well, and they don't play a musical instrument is that it's actually yet another proof that they are ordinary, kind of normal girls next door. And what's really interesting about this election is that taller girls, taller young women, routinely lose the election because they're th slightly threatening. The ones that are really beautiful actually don't win because they're threatening too. The ones that have slightly short hair, kind of punkish hair, dye their hair, they often don't win. Why? They're threatening too. Because People are looking for real girls next door, not some manufactured stars. Which is why AKB48 fans detest K-pop, because they think it's manufactured. The second point is that the whole phenomena incorporates democracy, and I would argue grassroots democracy. Of course, it's capitalist because you have to buy a CD to vote. <laughs> and I'm afraid to say I know men in my, in my age group, 30 old men, who buy 50 CDs so they can vote 50 times. <laughs> yes, yes I, uh, it's true. Uh, anyway, uh, but the point is, is that they do so in a f manner that is like at least North American or at least US type elections. Each of these young women actually go on campaigns. How do they campaign? They, if you ever watch TV news clips of Japanese political candidates, they know they have a sash. They have that. They give speeches, and they shake hands. They do these high five sessions and handshaking sessions, so that these very old men and some very young men will vote for them. But they incorporate fandom into something very intense. They become supporters right, in their popular campaign. The final element is what I'll just call everyday or quotidian narrativity. They become like something better than the weather for everyone to talk about. Around water coolers, in your office, in everyday life. So in Japan, it's very routine to find people talking about AKB48, their gossip, their scandal, and they become the least common denominator in everyday Japanese life. 
the innovations of girls' generation are completely different. Right? One is what I'll just call a particular form of manufactured perfectionism. It's a bit like, well, I was going to say Samsung phone, but without the bad battery. <laughs> that it depends on an extensive division of labor and extensive outsourcing and training system. What do I mean by that? The composers of these songs are very often Swedish. Sometimes American, sometimes Japanese, occasionally Korean. It doesn't matter. They go where there is a good source of composition. Uh, Koreans love Swedish pop. This is post ABBA pop because they think it's kind of innocuous and infectious. Choreography is done usually by Americans or Japanese. Design is done by usually Danish or Italian designers. So on and on. That is to say, they bring global manufacturing like a Samsung phone, right? They're not really manufacturing in Korea in the sense that different parts come from all over the world. And in a similar fashion, that's what the girls' generation exemplifies. Second is the highly self-conscious globalizing effort to market this group. This is actually quite new in pop music. Yes, there have always been the Beatles and Elvis and Madonna and Lady Gaga who become global pop stars. But they were not intending to become global pop stars. They become popular in UK or US and they spread around the world. But in most countries, everywhere, in the, in the US even, they don't try to export consciously. They're made for the local market and if they sell growth, that's good. So we know, for example, that, um, uh, I mean, we, well, actually I know, maybe you don't know, that if you look at top 10 groups in France or Germany, you would not recognize nine or maybe 10 of them because pop music, pop culture remains profoundly national in many ways. In the case of Gross Nation, they were, as I suggested, made to appeal Broadly, which is why they have two singers each who are fluent in Chinese, Japanese, and English. So they can go around the world. And the ones who are fluent in the local language then lead in their concerts and performances. The final thing is that the girls group embodies a new trend in pop music industry or in the world at large. That is that they rely profoundly on the social media and they are figments of what I'll just call the post thing economy. They don't really sell CDs or DVDs, except in Japan. They put all their music for free on YouTube, and they make their money in other ways, in concert revenues, promotion, fan clubs, selling gross generation goods, TV appearances, but not by the traditional route in popular music which was always to sell records, you know, LPs, CDs, whatever. They don't do that. And they express then a uh, leading edge, I think, in the popular music of 21st century in that regard. So we had here then two embodiments of culture industry. And the fundamental difference is not in their ultimate motive, which is, of course, to sell popular products but rather in their strategy. One, Akimoto and AKB48, is a resolutely national and local product. They don't want to appeal to anyone outside of Japan. Isuman Oli wants to appeal outside of South Korea. South Korea is a small market, and he knows there's a lot of money to be made in Japan, China, and elsewhere. And I want to suggest that this is the way in which they actually express something profound about the political economies of these two countries. One of the main trends in the Japanese economy after the property, property speculation bubble burst in 1990 is that the economy became increasingly introverted and invert, involuted. 
people talk about how living in Japan is like living in a lukewarm bath. Comfortable, not great, but you don't want to go outside. And so people talk constantly about how Japanese economy exemplifies what they call the Galapagos syndrome. Galapagos, as you know, is the island that Darwin studied the finches and animals. Meaning that you find flora and fauna you could not find anywhere else in the world. In Japan, it's like that. They have very interesting products. Warm toilet seats that acts as bidet, super small laptops, smartphones that are not like any of the smartphones available outside of Japan, but they don't export any of it. It's all for domestic consumption. And you can see it in things like students studying of studying abroad. It's very common in major US and Canadian and actually European too campuses to see many Chinese students, many South Korean students, but increasingly it's very difficult to find a Japanese student. And I think you can probably see this from your experience in the classroom. South Korea suffered or experienced a major economic crisis slightly later the so-called IMF crisis in, because of the Asian financial or currency crisis in 1996 and 1997. What's interesting is that unlike Japan, South Korea doubled down on exporting. Now, what the point I should have made earlier is that both Japan and South Korea were very much export dependent or export led economy in the post-World War II era. After 1999 in Japan, increasingly they don't export. They want to focus on the domestic market. South Korea increasingly wants to export everything now. And this intensified after 1997. And we can see this in almost every facet of these two countries. Universities in South Korea are desperate to globalize, so much so that some university presidents want to make all students and all teachers speak English, which is crazy because they don't speak English. But nonetheless, <laughs> they try to do so. In Japan, they have by and large resisted this. And of course, this is a very, very impressionistic thing, but many people comment that Japanese college-educated people's fluency in English seems to have been stagnant or even worsened where South Koreans, they try very hard to converse in English. Now, this is all part and parcel of globalization that's been sweeping the world in the last 20, 25 years, or longer, if you will. And many different things happen under the sign of globalization. Yes, homogenization happened, Mac McDonaldization, meaning you find McDonald's and ATMs everywhere. At the same time, you see various reactions, localization, anti-immigration movement. Right? You also find differentiation. Different regions want to become different so that they can appeal their products and the place. But one element that seems to be very common across OECD countries is what I'll just simply call bipolarization. Increasingly, societies become differentiated into kind of the globalized part, global citizens who kind of speak English, globish, and take part in this cosmopolitan culture. These are the college educated people. And there are others, local citizens, who does not take part, who does not benefit from this, and so who turn increasingly to parochialism or patriotism or a counter-globalization or anti-immigration movement. It's safe to say that you see this almost everywhere. Probably less in Canada than most. And this is, of course, intensified simultaneously by the collapse or decline of the welfare state and traditional forms of social support, like the nuclear and extended families. So it's not surprising that atomized individualized young people who do not have a good prospect of permanent employment increasingly turn to these activities like vitriolic territorial disputes. 
spending all their time on the internet saying amazingly racist and nationalist things. Now, before I move on, uh, I don't know if there's any J-pop fan here. Uh, maybe there are some anti-J-pop people, but I actually don't think it's anything to do inherently with the musical talent of Japanese people or culture, because there was the golden age of J-pop when it was extremely innovative in 1980s, when it first crystallized in 1990s with groups like Anzan Chitai and Amuro Minae, who became extremely popular in South Korea as well, even though they were technically not supposed to be playing. So the question you need to ask is, why did they not develop this industry, which was extremely popular throughout East and Northeast and Southeast Asia? And one reason, I think, is resistance to export, the fact that I mentioned earlier. So when I interviewed Japanese pop music producers and asked them, why don't you try to market your groups abroad? Why don't you want to make money? They said, ah, too much work, it's too complicated. I have to speak English. I have to understand their national laws and commercial regulations. Japanese word phrases, mendokusai, no, it's too much work. Uh, I make a lot of money at home, why bother? But the deeper reason, I think, is that, and this gets to a point which I'm not going to elaborate in this lecture, that musical genres and artistic genres often change when new technology is introduced. In the case of J-pop, it's very much a reaction to the CD revolution, which occurred sometime in the mid-1980s. So what happened before in J-pop is really kaiokyoku, or these light kaiyo music, which is, was also popular in South Korea as well. And CD revolution incorporates a lot of the latest American trends. And what's interesting about Japan is that it's become a very conservative country, not, not in the political sense, but cultural sense, in which people don't want to change much. It's the country if you go, you'll be shocked to see fax machines everywhere. They still have fax machines. They still use them. Not just that, they still have CDs and sell DVDs. I'm not sure if you've been to South Korea recently, but it's actually very hard to find CDs. And it's hard to find DVDs for different reasons to tell both about. So you get a phenomenon in Japan where because the domestic market is so protected, this is a, a CD from a couple of years ago, Lady Gaga CD. The same exact product on Amazon.com costs $7.63. It's, let's say it's about 100 yen to a dollar. Right? In Japan, it's a huge discount, 2,760 yen. Meaning that it costs four times in Japan for the same product. Even if you pay for the super duper express airfare, which will get the product in a day or two, which only costs $10 more, you still save $10. In, if you buy it from Amazon.com US in Japan. What enables this amazing profit margin, of course, is the structure of Japanese retail industry, which is still effectively protected. So you find in Japan that people have not gone to the digital revolution, the social media revolution. Yes, they have YouTube, but a lot of people don't use it. So the first video you saw of AKB48 was the first music video in Japan to have over 100 million downloads, meaning it was very popular. What did the Japanese production company do when they heard that 100 million people had downloaded this video? They immediately shut it down. Why? Because they thought their products were, was being consumed for free. They were losing money. The South Korean mythology is completely different. They want to put everything on the web. They want to distribute it for free. And part of the reason, of course, is that Japan has one of the most strict 
regulations of copyright laws. You can't violate copyright in Japan. You cannot copy a whole book. There's no copy shop in Japan who will do that. You cannot upload a video, TV show, or so on. They'll come right down. South Korea, if you spend time in South Korea, you know it's a land still of great piracy. <laughs> Meaning that you could never make that much money selling CDs. Because next day you could find pirated CD selling for a dollar or 50 cents on the streets. Same with DVDs. Japan is different. So you find that it's the one country that K-pop producers still try to create these physical products. Because Japanese fans will spend $50 on DVD sets of girls' generation group. When South Koreans see this about Japanese, it confirms all sorts of worse prejudices that Koreans have about Japanese people, how they're crazy. Because for Koreans, you get it for free. <laughs> Why spend $50? Anyway, but there's a deeper point about political economy here, that Japanese, by and large, have not really caught the way of the digital revolution that's been sweeping the world. Uh, when I was a young student, I uh, interviewed Sony executives. This is 30 years ago. And 1985 is the year that Sony was riding very high. It was the number one brand in the world. You know, it was really the Apple of its day. Apple, that's an iPod of its day. 1985 is also the year that Samsung Electronics was founded. And of course, I have to ask, what do you think about the Samsung Electronics to these Sony executives? And as many of you know, it's a horrible stereotype, but Japanese business executives, you know, they're not very demonstrative usually. But they almost fell off the chair laughing. Because how could you think that Samsung, this South Korean company, could ever be a threat to the mighty Sony? So like if you start a company and go to Apple and show Tim Cook, you know, are you worried about your new company? You're probably not. I mean, he's probably polite, so he won't laugh. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but as you know, by 10 years later, Samsung was outselling Sony. And now, very few people actually, young people at least, will actually remember Sony as anything but a minor company, whereas everyone knows about Samsung. And the reason is, is that Samsung actually gambled heavily on this digital revolution, in part because they had no prior expertise in the analog technology. Sony executives were, or Sony company, was extremely adept with the analog technology, so they continued to invest. So it's kind of an advantage of backwardness, if you will, for Samsung that they could actually take advantage of the digital revolution, at least in the in terms of popular music that happened sometime around 1996 with the invention of MP3 and goes full scale in 2005 with the beginning of YouTube. YouTube is only 11 years old. It's hard to believe that world existed before YouTube, but nonetheless. So what I'm suggesting is that in Japan you have this disjuncture, right, where they are not part of the globalized world. Well, as I mentioned, I teach often in Japan, and Japanese college students, when I tell them about this sort of thing, they say, well, surely people in US, Canada, France, and Germany must know about Arashi, this very popular pop group. And I always have to disappoint them, because I have never met an American who knew about Arashi, this super popular Japanese group. Maybe one of you know, because you're completely both happy. <laughs> uh, so what I'm suggesting is that AKP48 exemplify these trends. You know, it's, it's a form of ethnocentrism that is very hard to export. The trouble is, of course, ordinary girls are everywhere. So who wants to look at them? So as a concept, it can be exported, but as a product, it's very hard to export. Because they, as I mentioned, don't really particularly sing well, dance well, gorgeous, whatever. Um, but the final thing I'll say 
is that the export nature of growth generation goes actually deeper than the skin. It's more than skin deep. Because they're actually cut up. Meaning that the manufacturing aspect, which I wanted to mention earlier, is that this is, uh, so people ask me why would I write on K-pop? You know, am I just a dirty old guy, you know, who's interested in young girls? And no, actually, uh, not really. I'm interested in cultural change. And one of the things that's interesting to me is the relative conservatism of Japanese culture, which manifests in everything. I've been going to the same sushi shop in Tokyo for 30 years, and they haven't raised their price in 30 years. That's just one other aspect of conservatism of Japan. In Korea, everything changes. So 30 years ago, or probably not 30, but 40 years ago, no one would admit ever having been under surgeons, not plastic surgery. Why? Because Koreans fancied themselves to be Confucian. And they thought that you were supposed to honor and respect what your parents gave you. You know, kind of the reduction of observant is the old term literati used to not cut their hair, which is why they always had their hair in bun, like the sheiks, which is why they had these funny hats. They wouldn't cut their beard, sometimes they wouldn't even cut their fingernails. But from a supposedly Confucian culture, which didn't think you were even allowed to have plastic surgery, now it's become the greatest plastic surgery nation in the world. It's hard to find a South Korean person who hasn't had plastic surgery. When I go to South Korea, everyone thinks I'm Japanese uh, for various reasons. But increasingly, the main reason is I don't dye my hair. And like the Politburo or the Chinese Communist Party members, it's very hard to find middle-aged Korean men who don't dye their hair. In any case, I was going to end by mentioning Kangan style, but the only point I wanted to make was that in 1961, there was a song called Sukiyaki, which became number one hit in the US, Norway, Israel, and so on. And what's interesting about that is that it's only 16 years after end of World War II, when if you look vaguely East Asian in a North American city, people would say, remember Pearl Harbor. And the point I wanted to make is, this is something about the nature of pop culture. Because if you were 16 when the war ended, you don't remember anything beforehand. And so for parents, these are just, excuse me, Japs, but for young people, it's something new, young, and cute. So it's something to think about. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.